Hey there, what's up? Now we've got a creepypasta today. The first part is gonna be this video. It's gonna tell one half of the story. You guys wanna see the continuation? This tech sequel? This is kinda runs into the t -t 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 today, Junior! The other part of the story, let's get uh, 100 likes on the video. I I don't know if people still do that now on YouTube, but yeah, if you guys want to see the second part, 100 likes, set a goal, we'll set a call to action that way. And you know, like, subscribe, be super dope, that'd be cool. But also, I just want to say a quick thing. The last video did really, really well. I'm, I'm super happy about it and I'm glad you guys got something out of it. Just wanted to drop a quick thank you. So that's really dope. On to the creepypasta. When he told me he wanted to play pretend, I thought it had something to do with sex. And the funny thing is, if he'd whipped out a Wonder Woman costume, I would have gone along with it. Things have been cold between us for years. One word replies and tense conversations have become the norm. I was prepared to do what was necessary to try and patch things up when he clarified he wanted to pretend to be young. I felt a lot more hesitation if this was a sex thing. I thought... It could get pretty weird. Even as he explained it all, I just kept waiting for it to turn in that direction. I figured that's what it had to be, right? But he said it wasn't like that at all. He just wanted some time, now and again, when he could behave like a child. Nothing too weird, just sort of therapeutic roleplay. I'll admit, it wasn't what I thought. He wanted me to pack his lunches and kiss his cheek before going to work, he said. He wanted me to give him the kind of things you'd give a kid. So I packed him a yogurt, a ham sandwich, and an apple. There was also a small carton of juice all tucked neatly into a brown paper bag. His whole face lit up with joy when he saw it. I came up with the brown paper bag myself and he told me it was a nice touch. I remember thinking it was the first sincere compliment he'd paid me in years. I felt a rare pang of pride at that. After that, I got the gist pretty quickly. He wanted me to run in baths and sit there beside him while he played with toys. He wanted to ask me for permission before going out to play in the yard. He wanted spaghetti and hot dog for dinner and jelly and ice cream for dessert. I did it all with a smile. He never really looked at me all that much as a wife, but as a caregiver, it was like every little gesture was the greatest thing to him. I thought it was messed up, sure, but I don't know, those first few weeks were actually quite nice. One day he came home and I had the telly set to old cartoons from his childhood and he just burst out into tears. I'd bought the DVDs as a little surprise but didn't expect that kind of reaction. I ran over and held him and we stayed like that, huddled on the sofa for hours. I'd never felt that kind of closeness or vulnerability from him or, well, anyone else I'd ever met. It was confusing, but I liked it. We'd always been each other's closest friends and now he was spending more time with me than ever before. And he cared about what I had to say and genuinely paid attention to me. I once baked him a cake and he sat on the counter kicking his legs, asking me questions the whole time. I told him about the recipe, about how my grandmother had brought it over with her when she emigrated, about how it had been passed down for generations, and I could see that he wasn't play acting. He really was blown away by the whole story. But the requests just kept coming. As did the amount of time he spent role-playing. It started out as something before and after work, but he soon quit his job and without notice it became an all-day activity. Like I said, it was part of the fun and I didn't put any limits on it. He did what I imagine most kids do all day long. He watched TV, played with toys and video games, ran around making silly noises. He also wanted to do the less fun stuff. So I had to set him chores, bathe him, brush and cut his hair, make him eat his vegetables. He even asked me to start organizing him homework. So I bought some old exercise books for low-level maths and English. He was never naughty, but he did like to make a fuss when I told him to do these things. But sometimes I'd catch a sly smile or a twinkle in his eye, and I knew he really liked it. 
There was something inherently bizarre and actually kind of funny about watching an accountant sit there and struggle when carrying the one. Still, it was a far cry from the very guarded and deeply arrogant man I married. I guess I'm just trying to put it all in order for you, but I'm not sure I can. There were times it felt wrong, I suppose. All my attraction to him went right out the window, but I didn't care because we didn't have sex that much as husband and wife, and even when we did, it wasn't very good. Maybe if you understood that I'm not a social person, you could see why I let this all happen. I don't have any friends, never have, not even when I was in university. His company, his placid, warm, and adoring company, it worked a kind of magic on me. I think also that I actually quite liked looking after someone. In hindsight, I probably should have just got a cat. At the time, I just liked the change of pace and I always suspected there was some dark secret lurking beneath him. My mother had warned me about this with men and I was just glad he didn't like killing hookers. This seemed harmless, safe, at least at first. As we settled further into routine, I started to feel lonely again, only it was different. This wasn't the bored listlessness of a day spent at home trying to look busy, it was more like standing over an ocean and looking down. I think it was the way he started to change, physically. I thought they were all deliberate changes, things he did to look less like an adult. Sometimes he looked at me and I didn't like it, it was a hungry look. I met a boy once when I was younger and he looked at me like that and I liked it. But coming from my husband in blue pajamas with a pacifier in his mouth and a rattle in one hand? God, I could have been sick. And come nighttime, the house started to feel different. Larger and colder than usual. I started drinking for some reason. I think partly just to unwind. When things broke, it was just up to me to fix them, or to answer the phone, or deal with bills. We had plenty saved up, so don't get me wrong, it wasn't like we were in dire circumstances, but there was no one else to share the endless responsibilities with, and I felt like a weight on my shoulders. Come morning, I'd have to go through the motions with a pounding headache, and I found that the days started to blur. Months passed. Maybe even a whole year. It's Hard for me to remember any of these events in a straight line, and that's not all my fault. I remember thinking that he was a growing boy, but that wasn't true at all. We ordered new shoes from online, and they were a different size to the usual. Smaller. He said it was because he wanted the light-up ones, but he'd been a size 11 as an adult, and the ones we bought him were for a young boy. I don't know how, but he wore those new shoes just fine. I pinched the toe and told him he'd grow into them. I have vivid memories of watching him struggle to put a stuffed toy on the top shelf, but he'd always towered over me at six foot three. Even now, I'm putting it all back together in my head and finding little surprises. There was always the sense that if I stopped too long to think that everything would rush past me and I'd miss it. Even trying my best to just go with it, I found myself feeling like a stranger in my own house. Things moved, rooms were rearranged, and new toys just appeared, all without me knowing how. A whole swing set was installed in the garden without me remembering, but when I checked, my signature was on the invoice. At one point, he began wearing diapers, and I didn't even notice until days passed. It just kind of made sense somehow. In the moment, it had felt so natural, and looking back, I seemed to remember my husband as a child, not a fully grown man. I'd been feeding a toddler, hugging a toddler, watching a toddler play games, but at the same time, it wasn't any of that. It was my husband sitting there with his long legs crossed and crumbs in his beard. One morning, I woke up to a dog and the next day it was gone. I searched for hours, feeling like I was going insane, but sure enough, there was a bowl and dog food right by the kitchen door. So it wasn't like I'd imagined it. There was no dog in the house, though, nor in the garden. Exhausted and beaten, I went to my husband's room for a final check when, at the sight of him, 
This strange apprehension came over me. I couldn't get the thought out of my head that he had done something. After all, if he was a child, he was a bit odd, wasn't he? He didn't play with other children. He didn't misbehave. He barely spoke. He was a good little boy, sure, but not necessarily all that normal. And of course, he wasn't a child. He was... He, he was something else. Standing there, I appreciated just how odd he had started to look. His hair was thinning. Not just falling out, mind you. It felt downy to the touch. Soft. Like a newborn's peachy fuzz. And good God, the smell. It was like a baby smell, but foul, like sour milk. And it clung to him no matter how much I bathed him and washed his clothes. There were days when I felt like I could choke to death on it, and I learned to breathe carefully through my mouth whenever we were together. His pupils were huge, too large for those small sockets. His eyes had always been spaced far apart, but placed on a child-shaped head, he looked like he was wearing a bad Halloween mask with doll's eyes instead of his own. Sometimes I'd catch him staring at me from around a corner or at the bottom of a long corridor. Sometimes that meant him standing there in the dark, audibly breathing as his shoulders rose and fell while some unseen thought excited him. Other times it meant glimpsing his gray head disappearing behind a wall or a door the second I turned. He drooled almost constantly and wiped the excess on his sleeve, but a lot of it landed on the floor anyways. There were times I'd find small puddles of spit in locked rooms, often just behind where I'd been standing. Other times I could hear his difficult breathing inches from my back, but he was never actually there when I turned around. I was afraid of him, I realized, and I nearly cried out when, standing in that dark and quiet room, he rolled onto his back as he slept in the crib. He opened a gummy smile and I saw that all his teeth had fallen out barring just a few and the closer I looked the more certain I became that even those were not his original ones they were too white too small too peg like to be adults incisors I I secretly hoped I was going insane the alternative was uh, it was somehow even worse. I was on the toilet when the doorbell rang. It was a shrill screech that grated, and I jumped so badly I dropped my phone. I quickly finished up and waddled over to the window with my pants still down. There was a van just outside the front gates, which were open, but there was no sign of anyone walking around down there. Normally, this kind of problem would just go away, and they'd leave the package on the doorstep, but something felt wrong. I couldn't hear my husband anywhere in the house. No footsteps, no babbling, no clacking toys or rolling wheels. That van just looked strange. The driver's side door was still open, the engine still running. I tried to digest what it all meant while running downstairs, stopping only when I saw the front door open. A gust of wind blew through the main house, drawing out all the homely warmth. I had images of our roleplay being found out, and fears of humiliation and embarrassment filled my head. There was something else muddled in with all the thoughts as well. We'd spent so long locked up together, my husband and I, safe and far away from the rest of the world. How would he react to this intrusion? As if in answer, someone cried out from the living room. I ran down the last few stairs and pushed open the door to find a small man shaking where he stood. Brown cardboard box clutched to his chest for protection. What? He stuttered. I put my arm around his shoulder and started to move him towards the door. I couldn't see my husband, but he was never too far away from me and I couldn't help but notice one of his favorite toys lying on the floor. He... he let me in, the man continued. Look just... look... it looked just like it! 
Suddenly, he turned to me and gripped both my arms. What's wrong with him? He asked. I've never seen anything like that before. I don't remember what I said, but I kept pushing him towards the front door, out of the living room and into the kitchen. A quick turn of my head and I saw my husband ducking back down beneath the sofa. He was the wrong size to be so quick and sneaky, but he had a way of hiding and moving around the house so that you almost never saw him unless he wanted you to. Uh, come, come on, I muttered, but the delivery man's feet were slow and cumbersome. It was like his head was all muddled up. It was just, it was, it was just a child. He cried like it had just dawned on him. Oh no, I frightened him, didn't I? He tried turning back, but I stopped him. No, no, I, I, I didn't mean to scare him. I just, I just hit his face. He stopped resisting and his shoulders slumped back down. What's wrong with him? He asked. Why, why do my eyes hurt? He's sick. I answered, finally pulling him the last few feet to the door. I shoved him back past the threshold and stood, panting to catch my breath. He's just... He's just very unwell. I said, stifling a sob, part lie, part truth. It's, uh, it's a condition. The delivery man looked as if he was still trying to sort his own head out, but it seemed like he bought it. He went to leave, putting one foot down on the porch step before suddenly deciding that he needed to make amends. Please don't report me! He cried, and I jumped a little. I, I didn't mean to come off as rude. My heart started to race. I could smell my husband, the stench nearly overpowering. He was so close I could practically feel him, but where he was I couldn't say. I just needed to get this man away before something terrible happened. He was babbling endlessly about offending me. Please, I said on the verge of tears. Please leave. Did he understand, I wonder? Sometimes, when I think back, I see a flickering of understanding in his eyes. It looked like empathy. I can't be sure because it was all kind of just blurring together. The shock in his eyes as my husband's arm grabbed his ankle cannot be understated. Neither of us expected him to be down there. I still don't know how he did it, but he was down there, giggling in an unhealthy falsetto rasp. Before anyone could speak, he yanked so hard the delivery man fell down backwards and his leg disappeared into shadow. With one hand, the crying man clamped down on his thigh as if to soothe some unseen pain. And with the other hand, he tried to push himself back out from between the wooden slats. But my husband was always a big man. And now he had a strange sort of air about him. A quiet, crackling power that followed him from room to room. The struggle was one-sided, and the delivery man screamed and howled. He gave up holding the one leg and tried using both hands to pull or push or drag himself away. I didn't know what was happening out of sight, but his face drained of blood and his screams just kept getting worse. I've never heard a man make a sound like that before. Not an adult man. It was scary in a way I wasn't prepared for. I think he asked me to help at one point. I contemplated calling the police, but never did. I was so terrified. I couldn't even bring myself to move. Occasionally, one of my husband's thick knuckled hands could be glimpsed as he pulled more of the man inside. Those hands looked so large, so pale, so deeply unhealthy. I could hear what he was doing. That didn't really come to my attention until I unpacked it all mentally long after it was over. But yeah, I could hear bones cracking and something like paper being torn. Was it an hour? Or just a few minutes? I don't know. The man just kept crying and pleading and my husband just kept pulling and pulling and pulling. The stairs started to buckle, but the wood was thick and strong. The final question came down to what would break first, a pelvis or a post? The delivery man's cries told me what he thought would happen. He was right. 
With a tremendous yell of joy, just like a child on their birthday, my husband latched another fist around the man's leg and pulled so hard there was a sudden crack and his victim fell limp like a toy losing power. What followed was a silence so heavy, it hurt my ears, broken only by the faint wet sound of my husband dragging the rest of the man into the dark. The space between each step couldn't have been more than six inches, but brute force won out. The last I remember of the man's face, he was pale with bulging eyes. The arrangement of his arms and legs couldn't even make sense anymore. He looked like a spider after you step on it. I stayed there for a while longer, hoping to hell and back I'd hear an ambulance or a police siren, but like I said, we lived far out of town. By the time it occurred to me that no one would rescue the man or me, the blood on the steps was congealing. My husband was still just out of sight, giggling and clapping like a kid making mud pies. Come on, I finally managed to say, speaking like the doting mother I was. Put your new toy away, I'll make you some lunch. I was washing dishes and staring into the yard. It resembled somewhere I'd seen before, but I couldn't remember where or why. My husband was somewhere upstairs, and I was alone. I'd often hear him thunder around up there, doing God knows what. His bare feet slapping on hardwood floors he'd once picked out an eternal neck and chinos. That seemed like a different person's life now. Hard to believe it was the same man who brought me something just days before that made me sick. He'd made it himself and had it hung on the fridge for a whole afternoon, like just another piece of macaroni art. Was that thing where the dog ended up? I wondered, running a dishcloth over the same plate for the second hour in a row. Movement caught my eye out in the garden. Something floated down past the tall hedges that walled in our yard and landed plainly on the overgrown grass. It was a bright, luminous yellow that glowed like a safety vest. God, I was so out of it. It was like a worm in my head. I could feel it. Maybe even reach out and grab it if I could just focus on it for long enough. But each time I closed my mind around it, each time I started to feel out the shape of this intrusion, this rewriting of my own brain, it slithered away. Frisbee, I muttered. And then just like that, she was there. She was maybe nine or ten. How had she wound up there, I wondered. Maybe she was lost. She was looking around like she didn't know where she was. I could see she was scared and my heart sank as I realized how awful our home must have looked to her. There was a time I was house proud, but now we lived in a decrepit filth. Of course the little girl looked scared, I thought. This was the scary house every child feared, with broken windows and overgrown bushes that choked a yard filled with rusted swings and abandoned toys. And this poor girl had lost her frisbee and... No. I said, first to myself and then once again to the room. No! But it was too late. I could hear him scuttle around before the house fell into quiet. From the outside, the girl started to say something. A uh, greeting, perhaps? There was a knife in my hand that I didn't remember taking, and I was outside before I had time to even think. The little girl looked at me and instantly burst into tears. I was sprinting towards her with a knife in one hand and a murderous look straight out of a horror film. But before that, before she'd seen me, she'd been looking towards a thicket of grass with disgust on her face. No! I screamed. Not at her, but at him. I picked her up in my arms even as she batted me away. I didn't care if this girl thought I was Satan himself. If she ran back home and told her parents about the mean, creepy lady, and they called the police, and this all ended with me safe and warm behind bars, I didn't care. I clutched my arm around her waist and willed it into a band of steel to keep her safe. She squirmed but could not break free, and I ran towards the gate as fast as I could carry her. It's okay, I cooed. He won't, he won't get you. I was halfway there when her screaming and wriggling stopped. Her head was over my shoulder and all of a sudden, she gripped at me like I was a life raft. 
The change was instant, and it made me falter. For a brief moment, I heard his feet pulsing towards me. I turned, brandishing the knife like a torch against the darkness, but nothing was there. The girl started screaming again, the sight of my husband sinking, and she held on to me with dear life. Not the baby! She screamed. No, 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 not the baby! Not the baby, I repeated. I won't let him! I backed up to the gate carefully and began to wonder what next when, out of nowhere, he leapt into sight and grabbed the girl's hair, yanking her head back while she screamed so hard her face turned beetroot red. He jumped up and down, hollering and crying like a giddy toddler with a Christmas present. His misshapen face was grinning, his gums black and bloody, but his hands threatened to tear the girl's scalp right off. I started to feel nauseous at the sight of him. His size seemed to change with every glance. I couldn't make sense of it, and I felt that worm inside my head wriggle and dislodge. Sometimes he was waist high, sometimes a full-grown man. But always those hands were too large for his frame and the brown flakes of blood still trapped beneath his chipped nails reminded me exactly what he wanted. No! I screamed and lashed out with the knife. The motion that came to me in a moment was a downward thrust and the knife was left embedded in my husband's right shoulder. He let go immediately and started to howl and sob. He seemed to shrink before my very eyes and I quickly set the girl down and pushed her through the gate. I pulled the bars shut screamed to her to run, and then quickly turned back to my husband, who was sucking his thumb and trying to pull the knife out with his remaining hand. After some awkward fumbling, he grabbed the handle and threw the knife towards the ground. It clattered on the ground, blood glistening in the sun. You're just like her, he said, his voice breaking and returning to the calm, authoritative man I'd once known. His beady eyes bored into me and I could have collapsed under that stare. The change in cadence was as sudden as a sheer drop off a cliff. I just wanted what she never gave me. But you're all the same. Suddenly his whole face bunched up into a twisted infantile smile and he declared with joy and delight in a voice identical to a child's. I'm going to crawl inside you. Dinner was cold. It was the first meal I'd made him after our little fight. I'd fidgeted over it for hours, filled with doubts and fears. But it all came to naught. He was too smart to fall for that. Whether he'd seen the rat poison or not, he didn't come for dinner. Now I was left with a problem. I'd stayed fixed to the spot in the kitchen, working away with endless looks over my shoulder. And night had fallen. The only light was in the kitchen, and it was a big house filled with inky black shadows that swallowed entire rooms and corridors. Often, I would glimpse a sliver of movement. Often, I would glimpse a sliver of movement. Like a shark's fin cresting a wave, I might see a blue piece of fabric catch the moonlight before disappearing back into the dark. He was out there. I had a new knife, at least, and something about the adrenaline in my veins helped me think more clearly. When I looked back in my thoughts, I no longer saw a child, but something twisted and deformed with delusion and malice. A disease had festered not only in our heads, but the space we shared and the world we lived in spilling out into reality like a migraine aura made real. I didn't know if it was an intruder or just something dark that had spread from within, but it belonged to me one way or another. I couldn't let it live. Dinner's ready! I cried. Come on! There was shuffling somewhere out front by the stairs. I don't know why I bothered saying anything. He must have seen me. I cried out again, my voice faltering from fear and exhaustion. I picked the plate up and put it on the threshold of the kitchen, its edge just inches from the darkness. You must be hungry, I said, doing my best to smile. Please eat it, I added. For me? A single chubby finger 
peeked through the doorway, and slid the plate across. It was so loud in the silence grating across tile. Something felt wrong, but in the moment I just hoped it was the sheer panic trapped deep within my chest. The plate whipped out of the darkness and struck me in the face. My nose cracked and my head snapped backwards, and before I knew it, I was on the floor. The plate rolling to a noisy stop a few feet away. It was whole, but one edge was coated in blood. I became aware of a coppery taste in my mouth and realized it was mine all over that plate. It felt like I was lying there for a good few seconds, agony ringing in my ears while I opened and closed my jaw in disconcerted shock. Slowly, layer by layer, things started to right themselves. There was a sharp pain in the back of my head, and I realized I must have hit it when I fell over. And there was a weight on top of me, pressing down, making it hard to breathe. Had I broken a rib, I wondered? But it didn't feel much like that. It felt like something was moving around, something sharp and painful. I looked down and saw my husband's cabbage-shaped head bobbing away at my breast. I screamed and pushed him away, but he clamped down hard, those nasty little peg teeth burying themselves into my flesh and refusing to dislodge. I was overcome with disgust and started beating away at him, scratching deep gouges in his scalp and shoulders. Only when I buried a thumb in his nasty little eye did he relent and let go. He sat up and my thumb slid out of the socket with a pop, and for a moment he looked overcome with naive sadness. But then hatred washed over his face and his remaining eye glared at me with murder. He started to choke me. Those terrible fists clasping around my throat like bands of iron. I struggled, lashing my hands out at the floor and furniture desperate for something, anything that might help. Thankfully, my hands alighted on the knife and I drove it hard into the soft flesh of his armpit. For a moment he carried on as normal, but by the time I drove the blade between his ribs once, then twice, the blood had already drained from his face. It soaked us both, and to my horror it stank of sour milk and talcum powder. I watched the realization of his wound fully dull the fire in his eyes. He stumbled backwards, his face scrunching up as he let out a horrific ball. Pink foam seeped from his mouth and he gasped and choked. His lungs were filling with blood and I watched him die slowly before me. By the time it was done, he was a man again. A strangely dressed, emaciated wretch of a man, but nothing more. I touched my throat and it felt sore and my chest was a ragged mess. <laughs> Was it good for you? I asked, a laugh rising unbidden from my lips. The sound of my own voice scared me. I sounded deranged, but I couldn't stop laughing at the joke I'd made. And before long, my breath became short and consciousness slipped away in its entirety. It's been some time. How long, I don't know. And I still wonder whether he was ever real. I burned the house down, and I finally got to hear the sound of sirens coming to take me away. It was a weird problem to explain to the police. They had evidence of a child living in the home, but no body. They thought I'd offed a kid and burned the house to hide the evidence. Later on, they found one adult body, but it was the delivery man's, not my husband's. And I was arrested just a few short weeks later. Of course... I told them the truth, just barring a few of the weirder details. My husband had gone insane, I said. He snapped, started acting like a child, killed one man, then tried to kill me. Unfortunately, there are no records of my husband, nor our marriage, nor our life together. I lived alone. Unemployed because of a wealthy trust granted to me by my family, the mortgage was not paid by my husband, rather the trust. All of this was news to me. He was real. I know that much. I still have the wounds to prove it, and they found the little girl who testified somewhat in my defense. 
She really had seen a man dressed as a baby, she said. Although, when asked to give a description of what he looked like, she broke down screaming and had to be sedated. I knew what that felt like. I couldn't tell you my husband's age, his eye color, his birthday, or even his name. It's all worked against me. I think I'm on my second appeal, but my lawyer told me to lower my expectations. No marriage certificate, no wedding invitations, no relationship status on Facebook, no photos, no plane tickets for the honeymoon, no official documentation. Every conceivable trace of this man's life simply doesn't exist. I managed to get a brain scan, and they say my brain should belong to a dementia patient, except I'm just 36. It's all full of holes, lesions, they call them. That's a good name for it. I said there was a worm, didn't I? It was eating through my head like an apple core. Not a literal worm, of course. Well, I, I don't know that for sure, but still. I think he did something to my head because even now, just the thought of him can give me a nosebleed. I don't remember much of my life before. He wrote over it like a computer file and deliberately blotted out whatever didn't suit his purpose. And of course, they never did find his body, did they? Bit of a cliche, I know. I think it was childish of me to ever believe that a few holes in the torso would kill him. It, I should say, after all. He was playing pretend at being human just as much as being a child. Okay, did anybody else notice, like, the little descriptors she would give throughout that story? Like, there were a couple times where, where she mentioned something, and I was like, huh, wait a minute, why are we not clarifying? And I was, I was like, something's going on. Is this in, is this in her head? Because I thought that, I thought, oh, okay. Ugh, hair in my mouth. I thought, okay, so if she's nutso and she's just crazy, this is all in her head. But then the little girl went on the stand to testify for her. Granted, she broke down freaking out, but maybe it was just because the look of the her husband was so grotesque that she just like was like, no, I don't want to relive it, fuck! Ah, no! So that made me think like, okay, was the husband really doing all this shit? Cause that's like, that's a huge, that's a huge thing. Like the, we don't have any reason as to why he was doing this. I mean, aside from, I mean, maybe they had like meat the night before and they didn't cook it all the way and they got like brain parasites and it's just kind of like making them see fucking crazy shit. I don't, I don't know. This is crazy. This is nuts. The last, like, half of that story kind of fucked with me. Because it's that thought of, like, okay, yeah, we played around for a little bit. We were just kind of going along with it. And then she says, then we fell into our routine. And it started to become, like, oh, this isn't fun anymore. He's legitimately taking, he's just a baby. I'm looking after, li quite literally, an adult, a man baby. And I have to do everything. This fucking sucks. This, there's no, this doesn't end now. But... The other part of this story is called My Wife is Taking the Roleplay Too Far. So this one's called My Husband's Taking the Roleplay Too Far. The second part, My Wife's Taking It. So it's safe to say that it's coming from the perspective of the husband, which is kind of going to be interesting because uh, maybe we get filled in on some more shit. Maybe he kind of divulges some information. Maybe, maybe. But if you enjoyed the video, please hit that like button, subscribe for your boy, and turn on the notification bell. If we get to 100 likes, 100, I think that's pretty doable. 100 likes, I will get going on the uh, second part of this story so we can get the, the full encompassing story, the everything. Yeah, it'd be super dope. All right, thank you guys again. Last video did fucking crazy. You guys are great. All right. See you next time. Sleep tight. And don't let the bed bugs bite. Bye.